eyes above, so below. Welcome to Connecting with Your Coincidences. I am your host, Dr. Bernard or Bernard Beitman, speaking with somebody who speaks a little British. Uh, and I host this show, but I also have a, a Psychology Today blog and um, a book, Meaningful Coincidences, in which I try to outline the basic elements of uh, meaningful coincidences. And the you you can look on my podcast list and i talk about uh, the book i talk about summarizing the some of the parts of it that you might find interesting also i'm the founder of the coincidence project and if you go to the coincidence project.net all one word then .net you can find our you can find our website and hopefully join our coincidence cafes which take place every third Saturday, every third Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we tell each other coincidence stories. And we're going to, as we do on this show, we're going to be talking about coincidence stories. Our guest today does something very interesting with her grandson, uh, who's about age 12 <laughs> now, but she's been doing it for a while. She's been helping him become more telepathic. Now, how many grand um, grandmothers are doing that with their grandsons? I, if she's doing it, somebody else is doing it. Uh, we just know that about the way these coincidence things work. Uh, we're all connected somehow, and we're not that special, even though we can feel that. But it's not that common. So we're going to hear a little bit about how Sandy does that. Sandy's the founder of the No BS Book Club, the spiritual book club, is a professional journalist, author, talk TV, radio host, I mean, and more. Uh, she's super connected out there. Hey, she cut her teeth in the ultra competitive world of British newspapers and magazines, interviewing everyone from movie and music stars to leading scientists, politicians, authors, filmmakers, and new thought teachers, and yet more. She knows a lot of people and she bounces back and forth between the United States and England. And right now she's in Scottsdale, Arizona. And Sandy, it's great to have you. And I was glad I was a guest on your show. We've talked for a while. It's nice to have you be the guest on my show. Thank you, Bernard. Yes, it's hard to be on the other side, isn't it? <laughs> it's a it's an it's a treat. It's a treat. So I, I've told our audience uh that you are um that you are uh, teaching your grandchild uh, how to to um, be more telepathic. I wonder if you could tell us how that got started and more importantly, how you're doing it and how he responds to that. It started when he was about five and he started playing football and he got so upset because week after week, he didn't score any goals. So I talked to him about crystals and how they can store information and that if he stored his visualizations in his crystal and he did that every night, then sooner or later he would score a goal because it was the power of his intention and he's training his unconscious mind in that direction. So I gave him a crystal and he started doing that and then, uh, you know, some months went by and then he started. So did he goals. start, did he start making more goals? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. And he's a really good footballer now. He was actually spotted by, um, uh, you know, one of the county teams and he was training with them for some time. He's very good at all sports. So but he's also very competitive and he doesn't like losing. So he gets really upset, you know. So I keep telling him it's all in the mind. If you can if you can, you know, focus your mind on this and set your intention, which you know, I think that there is a huge link between intention and coincidence um, and synchronicity. So anyway, when he was about 10, we used to go for walks with the dog and I used to talk to him about the powers that he's got that he doesn't even know he's got. And we started talking about telepathy. And um, so uh, I started I, getting him a, to think. That's an impor important phrase you just used, uh, the powers that he has inside of him. And those powers... Those powers are also powers uh, our people in our audience have, and that's 
part of what we're talking about here so that we we can help people who are interested to develop a particular power this telepathy thing which is we have a lot of experiences with it without knowing a bit about it the most common one being thinking of someone and they contact you by phone or email and that's pretty common out there but it's not recognized as common so it's something to build on and here you are with a highly competitive guy uh who uh you're helping set intentions and using crystals to be able to do that. So uh, keep telling us the story because I think it's a very useful one. Um, yeah. So when we go on walks, what I do is I say to him, think of a number between one and 10, see if I can get it, you know, and then I get him to do it the other way around. And uh, there's been quite a few times where he's been on target, but statistically, I don't yet know if it's significant, but, you know, we just, we just play this game. I'm kind of putting seeds into his mind that he can do these things. And he is, I mean, he's really good at hockey. He's really good at tennis. He's good at everything he does, but he's got to win all the time. So I keep saying, if you want to win, you know, you've got to put some energy into it. Well, when, and when you tell him to put some energy into it, could you be more specific about what you're suggesting to him? Visualizing, visualizing himself winning um, and visualizing and, you know, putting that visualization into a crystal. And so I've noticed that he sometimes, you know, 12 years, 12 years old, you know, almost 13, they don't really want anything to do with our world but I notice that occasionally he will take a crystal to bed with him the night before a football match aha <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I used to uh, I used to play football and baseball and I wanted to hit the opening pitch for a home run I was I batted first and I did it in a playoff game I wasn't a big home run hitter and run the opening kickoff back for a touchdown and when I played football I did that uh, twice and it uh, it really helps to imagine in sports and sports people have recognized that for quite a long time now. Psychologists of sports guys have them visualize it because it's almost like you're practicing it in your mind. Uh, that's practicing for the world. So your, 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 your brain kind of knows that it's the happening already and can enact it. Um, it's, at one time, uh, I, I enacted uh, uh, something on a football practice field, and that same thing happened uh, two days later, and I was a, I was ready for it. So that was a precognitive doing it beforehand, not even imagining it, just because of a weird circumstance. I was returning a punt, and there was two guys coming at me, and I had practiced running between the two of them two days before, and somehow we have the ability to know what's going to happen and we have the ability to imagine what we want to have happen and on the sports field it's probably an easier place to do it because you got it's delineated you got um, a, a space to be able to do it in uh, have you tried to help him do that outside of sports uh at school with his exams i you know my nephew years ago um I taught him a little trick of revising for his exams with a crystal in his hand. Take that crystal into the exam room and have it in your pocket. And if you're stuck, just put your hand on it. And he couldn't believe it when he passed all of his exams, uh, got really good marks. And um, he did, you know, he said, I really do think that crystal helped me. Now, whether this is the placebo effect, who knows? We can't really measure it, but uh, it worked for him. What and I really do think that intention, intention is the key. Uh, yes. Um, when you when when you ask him to take the the crystal to the to school, what did he fill the crystal with? What was he thinking that he did with the crystal? And how did he do that? So I told him to just imagine that, you know, every question, it's like, oh, I know that answer and feel good about it. I, you know, there's an there's a question. I've got the answer. There's a question. I've got the answer. And it was all about his feelings, you know, feeling really good because, oh, this is so easy. I know all the answers and um, just visualize that over and over again. Visualize himself coming out of the exam thinking I did good there and visualize him getting the results 
and knowing that he'd passed. So that's it. It's visualizing what you want. Yeah, visual visualizing and putting positive emotion into the visualization. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You, you've I, got I, to have that. Yeah, I call them expectation videos. Uh, th that we're we're producing our own movies all the time, uh, yeah. Yeah. and we're doing it anyway. Uh, it's so why not take control over them because we're imagining what the future might be. The prefrontal cortex has a lot to do with making that happen, imagining what's going to happen. So organize it, put a lot of energy into it, and and intention is a it has both pictures, visual, and emotion in it. And I use the term expectation videos because it adds more detail to what you want to have happen. And that's what you just described. You go into the test and you have the feeling that when you yes. look at the question, you know the answer. Uh, it, it helps to enjoy taking tests, which I really like doing too, because it's just kind of fun to, to sit in there. But you have to allow some capacity you have, allow yes. it to be able yes. to em emerge at the moment you need it. Yes. And, um, you know, what you said there, the emotion is so important. A client of mine says, thoughts are electric, emotions are magnetic. You put the two together. And you can create miracles. Yeah, you know that's a very interesting uh, thing. Uh, electric and magnetic. Could you uh, elaborate on that? Because electromagnetism was Maxwell's big thing to try to figure out how they work together. Electromagnetism is fundamental to so much of what we are are living in and understand. So you separate them out, elect, and they are separate. Electric and magnetic thoughts are electric, and e emotions are magnetic. Please explain that. Well, I'm not a scientist. I can't explain it scientifically, but I think you know if you look at um, Rupert Sheldrake's work with the morphogenetic field. And, you know, the theory that everything started as an idea, everything that exists, every chair, every, you know, the computer I'm on started as an idea in someone's head. They then put more thought into it. And as they put more thought into it, they become really engaged. So their emotions also get engaged because the more they begin to see the way to create this, you know, device, this computer, whatever it is, um, and then you bring it into being. You know, to me, matter, matter is thought that is, you know, been um, crystallized, <laughs> give, given a lot. Yeah, crystallized. That's a good word. It's been given a lot of attention. And what I say to people is when you're doing your visualizations, add to it three things that you do not think are likely to happen and watch what happens. Because we want proof. We all want proof. We all you want know, proof. It's one thing yeah. to say, oh, yes, I knew, you know, I knew who was at the end of that phone before I picked it up. Oh, but that's coincidence. But if you can say, and I know what they're going to say, and, and, then you say, did I create that? That's not coincidence. That's too much to be coincidence. And then the more faith you have in your visualizations, your intentions, the more you will produce them. Again, thoughts are electric, emotions are magnetic. But I can't really explain it to you scientifically. Well, those are those are words that are very attractive, and I'm not going to ask you any more about it. Um, but there's there's something uh, that intuitively you know there's a distinction. There's magnets that go like this, and uh, there's electricity that goes like this. So that's something to do with what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, maybe the emotions are magnetic in that they help bring what the electricity is creating here and help make it happen out there. Maybe that's what you're you're talking about. I don't know. Um, but and it, the it, attention, you know, the attention on your intention, because you are focusing all of your energy on that. Because you're focusing all your energy on that. Because you're focusing all your energy on that, you know, it's it's like a laser. You know, it becomes very sharp. And it's got to be more powerful the more attention that you're giving it. You know, we just had a little bit of a uh, funny thing happen on my video anyway, and a little bit on yours. I saw that, yes. And sometimes 
when we we're talking about uh, high energy things on a Zoom thing, uh, there's a correlation with uh, a yes. disturbance in the in the communication through the through Zoom, and I'm not sure yeah. what that I'm not sure what that was, but that's a that's a correlation that's that is observable sometimes. And we yes. were do, we were doing magnetic and electrical, so right then it might have something to do with it. So that's um that's helping people recognize the power of their own abilities what i've been doing as you know is is putting energy into uh, the idea of meaningful coincidences and trying to be able to help it become more uh solidified in the minds of uh, anybody who was interested in it and pu putting energy into it is like imagining what you're talking about and i have the idea but i got to do something about it and that's the way i think about it you have the idea but you got to do something about it and that's electrical up here maybe magnetic trying to see what happens here but that's and you've done that with creating this vast network at least from my perspective of people that you know you just like running around connecting and you do it and you keep doing it you got a really good web there there's something about your own mind that i'm imagining is very web-like and you like to be able to like webify your world and have all and see watch how other people are connecting in the web that you're being part of and helping is that a reasonable description of what what you're doing yes except you know i am not a networker i would not class myself as a because i don't go out to network what happens and i think again this is intentions that i set you know when i was four i knew what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I when you were four, that. when you were four. When I was four, apparently I told my mother, I'm going to be a writer. I don't even know how a four-year-old knows what that is, but apparently this is what I said. And I've always known that was the direction I was going. So everything, you know, that I did was in support of that. You know, the, the, the stream that I took at school, the, you know, the classes that I wanted to take in order to support me being a journalist, a, a writer. I wanted to write books. But um, I think because I've had those intentions for so long, that they've developed, you know, their own momentum, if you like. I do not. I am not someone who actively goes out to network. It just so happens that in the line of my work, I get to meet a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the kind of person that once I've got this network, I use it. I don't, you know, I don't call on the people I know for, you know, favours or whatever, unless, you know, there's a really good reason. Um, I'm not somebody who uses that. So it's not, I don't see it as something I'm actively always engaged in for a particular purpose other than the shows that I do. You know, I'll reach out to someone if I want them on my show and that's it. Um, but the network does grow. And I think what it really is, is I'm a connector. I know I'm a connector and I'm also what I call a shameless sharer. So when I when I meet somebody who I think has got something interesting and I know somebody else who would be very interested, I have to put them together. So that's where the networking, you know, comes in and it's really to serve other people not myself because i don't get paid for connecting there's a particular joy in connecting people which i do also because uh, you know i've done 300 of these podcast things and i have other ways to connect with people so i like doing that too it's just it's fun i, I don't know how better to explain it and if it if it works and having it blossom uh that's wonderful and for for me some of it is connecting people who are interested in meaningful coincidences like a podcaster i was hey, you ought to talk to this guy who knows uh paul camera stuff better than anybody and he didn't know this person so it was nice to put him together with john townley and and they'll do something and i got on his podcast because a parapsychologist suggested that i be on his podcast and there's a pleasure in doing that for us uh, how do you understand that? I, I, you know, I was uh, doing an interview just last week and it was really about um, gratitude and generosity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's an act of generosity. 
that we have that impulse in us. You know, we don't want to hold it to ourselves, that we want to be able to support someone else. We want to be able to help them in their endeavours. And um, I think the reward from that is something that comes on so many levels. And the, all the science shows that people who are generous, people who give, actually live longer, they're healthier, um, they're happier. So I think that there's this natural inclination in us um, just to share with other people, to connect. Beautifully said, beautifully said. So why don't you tell us a coincidence story? Okay, I'll tell you a coincidence story that I think I think is really interesting. Um, when I was 19, I met at a football match um, my best friend. Um, we were both there supporting our fiancés who were playing in this match. And we became, there was something about her that attracted me immediately. And we became great friends. Uh, and I discovered that she was born on the same day as me, except she's one year older. So as life, we got married within a week of each other. We split up with our husbands within a week of each other. We got divorced around the same time. We did not have our children at the same time, but, um, she has a son called Alec. I have a grandson called Alec. The father, the son of her son, Alec, is called Daniel. My son is called Daniel. And it's not because we liked the names, because our sons don't have anything to do with one another. Um, so over and over again, we find we have the same things happening to us at the same time. So I think that's a really interesting coincidence. There's a um, doppelgangers is kind of the name some people give to that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it used to mean something like um, uh, people who look alike uh, in the Charles Dickens movies, uh, Tale of Two Cities. Um they're guys who look alike and exchange uh, roles with each other. Mm -hmm. But the term has come to mean more than that. Um, and and you're describing someone who is a double goer, or somebody who's work running through her life in some of the similar ways that you are. And it suggested it suggests a lot of different things. But what does it mean to you that you have someone who's running parallel life, a kind of parallel life of yours? Well, we are completely different personalities. I mean, chalk and cheese. And we don't, you know, we're not in the same business at all. And we don't go about things in the same way. Mm -hmm. So all of these coincidences do not seem to be connected to anything like that. They just seem to be these odd things that we go, oh, our mothers were both Libras, you know, all these little things that we find out about one another and go, that's strange. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, you know, I don't know who your audience is. Um, I don't know what their interests They're very, are. Most I, of them are interested in synchronicity. Okay, well, I firmly believe in past lives after years and years and years of study. I do think that the fact that the minute I met her, I felt like I knew her. I wanted her to be my friend. Um, and she felt the same. Um, you know, so I think that there are things beyond our kin uh, we could describe it as a past life connection um we could describe it as um some kind of uh resonance you know that is happening between us some kind of electrical field if you like mm -hmm. um magnetic field i don't know um but i know that she is the most important person in my life uh, you know, obviously, apart from my children, and my life would not be anywhere near as much fun without her in it. So she brings, you know, something into my life that I have never found with anyone else. I don't know how we explain that. So, so, so this this friend of yours, the important part of it is that she's one, your best friend of one of your best friends. It, it doesn't matter about these professional things. It's that you have a resonance with her and it's kind of confirmed by all these 
different little factoids that are hanging around with yeah. names and Libras and stuff. But the real the real thing is your resonance with her, that you, yes. your hearts are connected with each other and love being around each other, uh, and yes. both getting divorced around the same time. I mean, it's a, it's it's a lot. You you could share the journey with her of getting yes, married. Absolutely, <laughs> and yeah. it's a wonderful gift for both of you and each of you to be able to do that. And it's a form of syn it's a form of synchronicity. It's a coincidence that has a lot of meaning, uh, particularly about you and her and past life um how you explain these things is uh is up to you and past life is one favorite explanation and people have that uh and there's no arguing against it there can be arguing for it but the most important thing to me is right here right now is the two of you lo love each other that yes. this is a form of love that is wonderful where you can share so much together and it continues. That's the yes. wonder of that story. And I wonder from yes. our audience, and anybody wants to to, to email me, you can go to my website, uh, coincider.com, and uh, you can email me and tell me a story. And we'll have a place to sell, tell have you tell that story on the Coincidence Project website, where we're encouraging people to tell their stories like this one that Sandy just told us. You, you, Sandy, you have very much involved with um, synchronicity in your life. Uh, how did you come to develop such a, a strength of belief and use of synchronicity? I think it's really with repetition. You know, things happen, you don't take, pay much attention to them. Um, but then as you become more knowledgeable, I mean, I've been on a, a quest since I was a teenager to find truths you know to find out how things work to find out why we're here and what's our purpose and you know how does astrology work I mean does it work and all of these things and so all of my reading over the years has been in that direction and I think the more I've learned the more I observe and I go oh yeah those things are happening to me quite a lot you know and then you start paying more attention to them I mean <sighs> I, I have synchronicities, coincidences happening to me all the time. And the more I believe in them and the more I see them as significant, the more they seem to happen. And whether that's just because I'm putting my attention on them, I don't know. But as, as I said, I also believe that they're intricately linked with intention. And... Um, you well, know, let, I intend let, let's, let's now stop. to have synchronicities. Well, we're going to go. We can keep going back to the attention, but for me, for me to hear you, hear you saying, "The more I see them, the more I see them." That that the way you said that, and I can't even get it right now. I've heard that now a number of times recently. It's been more of a refrain that I've heard, just as I am hearing more and more people telling me about contact with uh, dearly departed ones. There seems to be getting to be the rage that people are connecting with uh, uh, people who died in their family and people they loved and who are communicating with them. And it's, it's like I, I get a chance to see the zeitgeist floating around to see what ideas are happening. The most important thing I can say again is to repeat what you said. The more you see them, the more you will see them. The more you yes. see them, the more you yes. will see them. Yes. I mean, Wayne Dyer wrote a book. Um, you'll see it when you believe it. Not you'll believe it when you see it, but the other way around. If you believe first, I really think that we forget how interconnected we are with the universe and with each other. Um, and we think we're separate and therefore all these things seem to be separate as well, but they're not. I mean, I know if I, if there's something I want and it isn't common, I can say, I want that and it's going to come to me. And it does. I mean, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I've been looking for six months ago, you know, I saw a particular jacket that isn't particularly fashionable it's not something you find everywhere um and I really loved it and I said I want one of those don't know where I'll find one but I want one and I've just you know every now and then I think about that a week ago I walked into a thrift shop 
there was the jacket. You know, I've done this, I can't tell you how many times where I say I want something and I know it will come to me. And just that belief and faith, I think, aligns me, you know, with walking into the right place to find what I want when I want it. And that's what you're talking about with intention and uh, synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine it. our intention out there, then that almost becomes like a, a th thought form, you know. Um, we hear about, you know, in Buddhist teachings about torpors, which are thought forms that actually have had so much energy put into them that they almost begin to take form. Um, you know, I think we can do that. I think we can say, this is what I want. Hold on to that belief. Know that you're going to get it. And you'll be guided to the right place, the right person at the right time. Magnetically. <laughs> well, I'm I'm imagining trying to get uh, uh, some good funding for the Coincidence Project. So uh, that's... Uh, that's what I've and got so in mind. And so you will. And so you will. I like what Deepak Chopra said when his wife said, what, you're quitting being a doctor? Uh, what, what are we going to do to feed our kids? He says, the money will come from wherever the money is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, love, I love that one. So, okay, money, come on over here and, and help support some administrative and research things for the Coincidence Project. What do you think is really happening when we're experiencing these seemingly impossible coincidences besides maybe the intention thing they're talking about? I think we're engaging with something unseen, uh, whether it's an energy, I, I really don't know. But I think that, you know, we hear a lot of trite things in the spiritual arena, um, you know, like the universe provides and uh, ask and it shall be given. I mean, that's in the Bible. Um, I believe there's a lot of truth in that. You know, I think if you align your thinking, uh, you know, I think the universe is a very benevolent uh, force, you know, energy. I don't know how you would define it, but I think that we are a lot more connected to a lot more resources things than we realize and when we start believing that like my grandson you know you start believing that you can you know project a, a visualization into that crystal now are you just convincing your own mind are you you know priming your subconscious i don't know but i think it's all the same thing quite honestly we can have our different explanations for it, but there's something about imagining, uh, again, attention and helping it happen. Now, the How does this might apply to um, to the major problems humanity is facing, including uh, the effects of global warming and all this political strife that we're uh, experiencing? Well, I think that if enough, enough of us are conscious enough to put our thoughts on peace. I mean, you look at the HeartMath project um, and the Global um, Coherence Initiative, they have had people, you know, meditating um, and, you know, sending out good thoughts in places where there's been disruption, upheaval, et cetera. And they have actually measured. I mean, you can find all kinds of, you know, uh, scientifically um, validated uh, initiatives that they have conducted over the years on their website and I think what happens is we we become you know coherence is a good word everything is energy and I think what we're doing when we are projecting something like this is we are cr creating coherence between us and something else that then becomes a supportive kind of connection you know one thing I'd like to say is that Many years ago, and I'm going back about, you know, 30 years, I remember reading a report uh, in a magazine about visualization and how they had used it with athletes who had been injured. And they, they got these athletes to turn up for the exercise sessions, the training, and instead of actually doing the training because they couldn't maybe they'd hurt a leg or broken something they had them 
visualizing along with the others that they were doing this. And they did this repeatedly. And then they measured them and they found there had actually been changes in their physiology and in their muscles. Now, if visualization can do that, what else can it do? Well, what else can it do? You know, I had a friend who had cancer and before every single chemo session, she would take time out and she would visualize. She would visualize this stuff coming into her body, not as toxic, but as some, you know, some kind of, um, you know, potion, magic potion that was actually helping her. She wasn't sick once. This is back in the days when people would get horribly sick with chemo, except one day when she was running late and she didn't get a chance to do it. Now, did she have a belief system that, oh, I'll only be set, I only won't be sick if I do my meditation? I don't know. But the one day she didn't do it was the one day that she was sick. Perfect. Even if that is her thoughts, that in itself is powerful. You know, the placebo effect i mean it's far more successful than you know giving people drugs in trials they know that it's being studied now at universities american universities we you know our minds are the most powerful things we've got and i think we can create synchronicity well uh, to back that up i i was part of a research program with panic disorder um, uh, using a medication and a placebo. And we, at the beginning, they allowed me to uh, use a, a form that uh, measured per people's expectation of change or readiness to change. You weren't ready to change. You were ready to change, basically, were the two different things um, that were we were measuring and uh, the placebo the placebo group who expected to change did just as well as the uh, active drug group that didn't expect to change and th that's my direct experience of it and it was turned down by some of america's finest psychiatric journals uh they didn't want it uh it, it didn't seem to be something that uh, they could believe in and it, coincidentally, it got published because the editor of a new journal was the cousin of uh, a guy who lived down the street from me when I was growing up. And I think that really helped make it get it published. They didn't want to believe that. Coincidence? <laughs> Coincidence, yeah. I still remember Walter Udy was his name. He used to go over to some girl's house together and because we were both scared to go over there. Uh, and, and that's his cousin had this journal so yeah it was coincidence yeah my life too has been uh, a coincidence uh, circus i mean it's been fun to be able to to believe this stuff happens and just go with it the this imagining of the body imagining the body doing something joe dispensenza was able to to heal a major uh Yes. blow to his back so he was paralyzed just lying yes. there being able to imagining uh, imagine that and he's built a very successful uh, career influencing people to be able to use the powers they have within them to be able to do that and you're emphasizing that too now what, what i kind of i think want your help with now that i think about more clearly is that you recognize that mind and outside are connected with each other and that is a fundamental lesson of what meaningful coincidence whatever you want to call them but synchronicity or whatever but our minds are not disconnected and the evidence of telepathy is a suggestion the evidence that you can imagine something and it happens is evidence that this thing is embedded in a in a context of meaning that is responsive to what we're thinking about so I'm suggesting that that we develop consciously a collective human organism made up of individual cells, of individual people whose purpose is to do something better than what humanity is doing to itself and collect ourselves and create as a collective an, a set of intentions that can make the world a much better place than it is intent, seems to be intending to go. 
And to be able to develop that CHO, this collective human organism, is part of uh, what I'm trying to do with, with the Coincidence Project. I'll tell you something that might blow your mind. I don't know if I've told you this before off air. Um, Professor William Tiller, uh, materials physicist, you know, Professor Emeritus, Stanford University. He died a couple of years ago. He was a good friend of mine. Um, he wrote several books on consciousness, uh, academic books where he was explaining telepathy. He was explaining all of these things. Who was, um, he who got was, vilified. Who, who was that? Professor William Tiller. Okay. Um, you... you can go to his website. You can find lots of white papers there. He got vilified by his peers in the scientific community, talking about consciousness. Um, he was in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? Yeah. And um, Bill used to use this device. He called it an unimprinted intention device. <laughs> and he, with meditation, with his wife and with two of his lab scientists who were meditators, they would set certain intentions. He was able to prove, and this, you can do, do the research and find this. He was able to prove that he could change the pH balance of water in a lab in Germany from his lab in Arizona. That is on record. He did it. Statistically significant change in the pH balance of water. Right. I have a friend who works with nonverbal autistic children, telepathically. I introduced her to Bill and they, she has lots of clients all over the world and they decided to do an experiment called the autism intention experiment. And they were going to set an intention very carefully. They were going to meditate on that intention um, they and they were going to use a computer and I'm, I'm not quite sure of the technology and how it worked but they were going to use a computer to broadcast this intention to certain of the parents who of autistic children that had been working with Susie and these parents were all over the world and they were going to and they'd enrolled in this they wanted you know to see if this experiment would have any effect and i think the intention was it wasn't that these kids would be cured because in their language these kids are not broken they're just different um but it was that these kids would be able to integrate in their bodies in a way that was beneficial to them um and they were going to switch this on at a particular time on a particular day. The day before they switched it on, a woman, a mother in Australia called Susie to say, my child is talking. I had that woman and Professor Tiller and Susie Miller on my radio show because I wanted to share that. So I had the mother call in from Australia to verify that. And she wasn't the only one. And they believe that when they, and they had proper, you know, statisticians monitoring all of this. And uh, you can go on, you know, I think Bill Tiller's website, you may be able to find the results of that. Is that coincidence? Is that synchronicity? Is that a melding of intention? The parents wanting to be engaged in this. We do know that whatever you're thinking can change the outcome of an experiment. That's been proven already with the double slit experiment um, and many others. But, you know, what is that? Is that intention and synchronicity working together somehow? Are they the same thing? Um, part of the problem with, let me say, coincidence and that includes synchronicity is if you don't have an explanation for it um then it's can be whatever explanation you want to come up with uh and people have all kinds of explanations for synchronicities and uh, there are multiple explanations available they're not all part of the same 
they all can't be explained by the same thing. Although statisticians want to say random and some people want to say universe as explains all of them. They, they don't, but there's a subset that you are describing that is very directly related to intention, to what you think has an influence and great impact on what happens. And a basic synchronicity pattern is a, a mental event and an objective event correlating with each other. Mental event, objective event, mind and object correlate. And that strongly suggests our minds are connected to our environment. But what you're adding and emphasizing is that you energize an intention that becomes the beginning of a causal explanation. It isn't the full thing, but it's a step towards saying the synchronicities is not just out of the blue or random or universe. Mm -hmm. There's something we have to do with making them happen. And it's so important for our audience and anyone who wants to listen to this is that you have something to do with making most of these things happen. Let's look at what you're doing that may have accidentally made it happen. And now you can listen to Sandy and she will tell you, pay attention to your intention because your intention has a lot to do with creating perhaps a thought form that materializes in the real world or matches with something that's out there so that what you're seeking may also be seeking you. And that's a fun part of all of this. Sometimes you're not the only one, but yes. something somebody yes. else out there is also looking for you. And I love that. I love the balance that, that, that happens sometimes. But you're saying it's not, you're saying something that I would suggest phrasing a little differently it, it is still they're working together but intention helps to increase the likelihood of a synchronicity that's the way i would say what you're saying i think so i think so and you know again i refer to rupert sheldrake's work you know you're holding that thought and even if you're not consciously thinking about it all the time the very fact that you have that emotion attached to that object you know let's take my jacket you know i was thinking of jacket yeah yeah, and, you know, it's obviously there in my unconscious because I've set my intention on it. I'm not actively thinking about it. You know, I don't often go to the town and to the thrift store that I went to on that particular day, and there was that jacket. You know, how long had it been there? I have no idea. But it hadn't been bought by anybody else and there it was waiting at the moment that I went in and I said, there you are, you're coming home with me. And I wasn't surprised. You, you expected know, it. I, I mean, I knew that it was going to happen. The only thing I didn't know was quite when it would happen. Yeah. But there was a, a degree of satisfaction, you know, when it did. So how powerful am I? And that's what I would say to every one of your viewers. How powerful are you you know how powerful that's, the, are that's you? the great adventure in life is to find out how powerful you are and what you're capable of yeah yeah it's a wonderful message sandy it's a wonderful message uh, I, I I have some of my favorite explanations for things uh, and I would add to your intention about the jacket the need to be able to go to that thrift store that you don't go to very often at the right time and I call that human GPS, uh, where you're able to get to where you need to be without kind of knowing wh why you're there, but having a feeling that you need to. So I add that to the intention. Uh, you got to actually do something a lot of times to make it happen. See, now we're adding another element. You're talking about um, that need or that feeling. Uh, you know, I'm a great believer in trusting your gut because I think our gut is the seat of our intuition. Um, and I think that it's all connected. You know, maybe my intuition said, go there at this particular time. You know, go it now. Did. It Don't did. Wait two hours. <laughs> it did. You know, so yes. So then now we're looking at everything is connected. You know, our intuition in our gut, we might think is separate from what we're thinking in our brain. No, it's not. No, Nothing it's a... is separate. 
I, of course, we have different experiences, but the intention is a mental and somewhat heart putting the emotion into an idea. Uh, the intuition in this case is go there right now or go there soon. Uh, and that's a that's a body thing to move through space. And you need the and it's a wonderful description of how heart, a mind and heart and gut and body uh, are working together to try to manifest what you're looking for. Yeah, but nothing, nothing said to me, go there now today and you will get what you want. It was all unconscious until I saw the jacket. Yeah. And then it became conscious. Well, that, that's where that's where you're emphasizing what's so important is that the conscious mind has a role to play, but there's so much else going on. I have this thing that with bodies that uh, sometimes people uh, have to like do two different things with their bodies. Uh, it, their bodies are kind of like get in the way of, th of things somehow. You get these feelings in your body and they get in the way of your thinking about stuff and your heart and stuff. But your body is also a picker up of good information. Your body may be more connected to your higher self than even your mind might be, your rational self. So the body plays mm -hmm. two different roles on on this polarity world that we're in. Sometimes it's just a drag you got to take care of and be, do something with. Sometimes it's a great messenger, as you're suggesting in this case. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So well, then you, once you know that, you start using it. Once you, you know that, it. you start using it. And that's it's yeah. the whole, I, whole idea of this with where, where you and I sync up so nicely is to be able to find the powers inside of you uh, to be able to manifest things that are useful to you. And my my intention is to try to do that worldwide, as many other people are trying to do that. And I use a model, as I mentioned, the collective human organism, that we as a group be able to collectively imagine this future, because it only follows logically from what you are saying, that we collect and we remain part of something bigger and yet continue to operate with our own individual selves. We need to evolve along with our being part of the collective human organism. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I, you're helping me think about how to be able to ima imagine that. So I uh, thank you for that. Well, all, this is all happening anyway. I mean, look at the, you know, we all know that the media has so much power now. And that little device that we have in our hand, you know, has changed our brains because we no longer focus. We don't focus on anything for very long because, oops, there's another piece of news. Oops, there's another piece. You know, we don't have time to process and integrate information very well. So our minds are easy to hijack. And they're being hijacked all the time because we're being influenced by advertising. We're being influenced by so many things outside. If we can be influenced in that way, then our minds collectively can be influenced in a different way. You know, we can say, I'm going to put my mind to work for, you know, I'm going to think about world peace. And maybe I have a little group. You know, and maybe that little group has a little group and and so on. I mean, it's it's all happening. It's all showing us what we can do with our minds if we're in control of them. Very well said, too, Sandy. Um, I, I like to think of our, our technological advances as indicators of our own personal powers uh, that, for example, telepathy we can do that. Now we have a telephone and we can do it on Zoom too. Clairvoyance, we have webcams to look at someplace else, but we can do that without the technology. And here you're emphasizing how the technology is influencing our minds towards capitalistic and power over our minds that robbing our imagination is the way I would also think about that, that we can in, we can infuse people's imagination with letting them recognize synchronicities, recognize how their minds influence their environment, how our minds are connected to our environment. And these are, we're not the only ones talking about this, this is going on now. And when I'm, what my part in this is to 
try to emphasize the role that meaningful coincidences can play in seeing how our minds are connected to our environment and how our minds are connected with each other. Not that we're all part of one thing, we kind of know that, but to show how that's happening in a way that becomes functional, that we can then do something in a positive way for the way we're the way we are living on this earth mm, absolutely yeah and check out heart math you know they'll show you that it's already been done they'll show you the results heart math you're talking about heart math the organization yeah it's yeah. what they do wonderful work yeah. yeah yeah they're showing the collectiveness of groups with good data and that's that's yeah. if you need data go to heart math about uh, how we're connected with each other well, Sandy, we are we're, coherence initiative. Co coherence. Well, yeah, that's you're talking about the Princeton study where, uh, well, Princess Diana is the most a well known example when she was murdered and they talk about that or whether or when she died. There was a lot of coherence in the world, people focusing on that, yes. and our collective yes. minds were, were focusing on what had happened to her. And it shows that we can be collective once we get scared, yeah, but or get upset about something. Yeah. Maybe we can be upset about the way the world is going and, and get collective and be, being better about the power of our intention. So, Sandy, I have, we're going to we're come to the end of our our time together. And is there anything? What, what else would you like to be able to say to our our audience very interested in synchronicity? Um. I think I've already said it. I mean, I just want people to know that they have so much more available to them than they think they have. And anyone who's struggling right now, you know, that may sound like, yeah, it's okay for you to talk. But truly, I mean, there's so much evidence out there. There are so many great books. I interview people like that all the time, and I know you do too, that can actually offer us some evidence. Um, but, you know, believe, believe that you have power. Life doesn't have to happen to you. Believe that you have the power. Mm. Very good. It starts believing is seeing, not seeing is believing. And that's a seeing is believing and believing is seeing. Are, seeing. They, they're, yeah. they run around together. Uh, but yeah. the power of believing uh, is what's been ignored. And we are doing that. So thank you for intending to intentionize our audience, Sandy. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. Likewise. Thank you, Bernard. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness